Good afternoon. We come in our daily Bible reading to Romans chapter 12. And while this really begins a new section, verse 1 starts with a very important word, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Pointing backwards, that word therefore, on what basis? Well, the entire reasoning of Romans is important, but the immediate context of chapters 9 through 11 is God didn't just turn his back on the Jews. They turned their back on him. And in some cases, some of the Jews were faithful. They were no longer just Jews by birth, but rather by faith. That is, they're Christians now. It all came down to one important matter. At the end of Romans chapter 9, what do we do with Jesus? Is he the foundation of our faith, or is he a stumbling stone? In Romans chapter 10, it's very clear that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Israel had a chance to hear. They should have understood. But in many cases, although not all, they didn't. And in Romans chapter 11, this thought is continued in addressing the Gentiles. Just because the Gentiles could now become Christians doesn't mean that they are forever there as God's people, that they can't lose their faith. The key found in the middle of Romans chapter 11 is do we have belief? Belief is what allowed the Gentiles to be grafted into the tree, and unbelief is what cast many of the Jews out and could cast some of the Gentiles out as well. And so the point is the gospel is the power of God into salvation for everyone who believes. You can see all the way back in Romans 1 and verse 16 that Paul had this thought in mind, the importance of not only the gospel message, the need for salvation we have because we have all sinned, Jew or Gentile alike, but also that there is that remedy to be accepted by belief to the Jew first and to the Greek, the gospel is revealed. And so as we look at Romans chapter 12, let's note that phrase again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So let's break down these first two verses, and we won't do this with all of the chapter, I assure you, but there's a lot in just these two verses to go through. One of them is found in verse 1, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And of course, it's designated what that looks like, holy and acceptable, acceptable to God. But what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Well, that means to give up self. That means I have to put to death not only that man of sin from Romans chapter 6, not only the man who is consumed with selfishness, Romans chapter 1 and 2, or hypocritical service to God, but that I have to dedicate my life solely to taking whatever God has given me and using it to his glory and for his kingdom. That's a difficult question for us to answer, honestly. Am I doing the best I can? A living sacrifice gives up that which costs something. You might recall in the Old Testament that David wouldn't offer a sacrifice to God which cost him nothing. Well, that's what makes this question so difficult. Am I doing my best? I think when we're honest, we realize we can probably always do better. And of course, thank goodness that we have the mercy of God to call upon. That the sacrifice of Jesus not only allows us to go from an alien sinning state to within the body of Christ, but also that there is grace and mercy and forgiveness of when we fall short of that holy and acceptable goal. Now, as we come to verse 2, even more is added. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It's very easy to just go with what's around us and allow movements of the day or thoughts or even different practices and habits to form based upon what century and what country we live in. And that's a real danger. We are, no matter what country we live in, no matter what time period we're in from this side of the cross of Christ, to make ourselves like Jesus. It doesn't matter if we live in America, if we live in China, if we live in Taiwan, Japan, Italy, Spain, or if we lived in the 1700s. None of those change the fact that we are to be conformed to the image of his son, not the world. So how do we do that? Well, we have to be transformed. There is this transformation that has to be undergone. And when you look at the end, how do we understand what is right and wrong? Well, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We have to critically think. In fact, we have to use a word that's very unpopular in this current culture, which is we have to make judgments. Now, that does not mean that I get to send people to heaven or hell or that I should walk around and give my opinion on that matter. That's God's place. But to discern is to look at a situation, to analyze right and wrong, and choose the path of wisdom. And what are we looking for in that testing? What is good and acceptable and perfect? We are called to make all sorts of judgments as Christians. And one hallmark of this world is to say, let's not judge. In fact, I think if there's one verse in the Bible everyone knows, it's that Jesus somewhere said in some context, don't judge. Don't be people who judge others. Well, in some sense, that's true, of course. 
but in other senses we're called to make judgments all the time. That would be an example, by the way, of why we need to be transformed by the renewal of our, of our minds and not conform to this world. There's all kinds of problems. And by the way, in this world there are problems because of sin. Sin causes all kinds of issues that man comes up with different solutions for. But God has made it clear to us that if we are to be conformed to the image of his Son, there is only one solution for all of this life's problems, and it's Jesus the Christ. It is the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And so what does this look like in our life? Well, verse 3, For by the grace given to me I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. As you look at verse 3, what does this living sacrifice look like? Well, in verse 3, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. We have to be sober-minded about what we can do. Now, often when we hear the, the need to not be prideful, we rightly think of humility. But humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, as C.S. Lewis might put it. As you look at verse 3 and 4, really that is an important concept. Because to be sober-minded means to realize I have all kinds of flaws. And that certainly only God is perfect. And I need his grace and mercy to be perfected every day. But also, I have to realize something has happened each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Well, why is this so important? Well, God has given us all kinds of abilities and talents. I think here in Romans chapter 12, you see a mixture of spiritual gifts and non-spiritual gifts. As you look at verse 6, for example, some have been given prophecy, some service and some teaching, and some exhorting and some contributing and some leading with zeal and others doing acts of mercy. Some of those are things that we absolutely have and should be practicing in the New Testament church today. Well, why is that so important? Well, there's two critical aspects of this. One of them is found in verse 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. It's important for me to be honest about what I can do, about what God has allowed me to do, not out of arrogance, but because God has blessed us with this ability, and there's an expectation. You remember that transformation we have to undergo from verse 1 and 2, how to be a living sacrifice? I have to be honest, sober-minded about what God has allowed me to do, and make sure I'm using it for His glory to help others in the congregation who worship with me and Christians and non-Christians even around the world. God has given you some gifts. What are they? It's not arrogance to sit down and make a list and see what God has blessed you with. The key is, do I realize that God is behind them or do I think it's all about me, myself, and I? And so as we make a list, I would encourage you to do that today, maybe with your family or a loved one. Challenge yourselves to say, what are you good at? What is a strength of mine, and how can you use that in the work of the Lord today and this week to bring greater glory to him? Sometimes we get intimidated, but notice in the same list that Paul mentions prophecy, he also talks about service, teaching, exhorting, contributing, leading, and acts of mercy with cheerfulness. There is something in there we all can do. And of course, this makes us think that idea of the members one of another, of the body metaphor in Corinthians. And of course, it might be that I want to be an eye, but I'm not. I'm an ear. I might want to be a foot, but instead I'm a hand. Let's be honest with what God's given us. Be thankful to him that he's blessed us with any abilities at all. And make sure we're using, him to hit, using them for his glory and benefit. But also there's a second idea here in verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We need each other. It's not just this grand plan to serve God, which is true. But part of God's grand plan is that we help one another while we're here. And so sometimes people ask a very tough question. Where is God when I hurt? How, do I, how am I supposed to know that he's there for me? Well, there's a lot of encouraging scriptures that we should take to heart. We should realize we don't need to fear. That we have a God who cares, who listens, who wants us to cast our anxieties upon him, as Peter would write in 1 Peter. But also realize that I need to look around and see that there are brothers and sisters who are here for me now. And while they are great, we are only here together as part of God's plan. This means that this is God caring for me when we care for one another. Now, as we continue in the reading, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So what does this look like? Well, in verse 9, here's one of those judgments. For love to be without hypocrisy or genuine 
We have to look at something and hate, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. That means I have to have the discernment to recognize evil and make sure I don't just stay away from it, but that I actually, from my inner being and core that is trained by God's word, loathe it, hate it, abhor it. And I cling, hold fast to what is good. Now, generally, we're better at clinging to what is good, but hating the evil is a difficult part. You know why it's a temptation to be conformed to this world? Because it's everywhere. It's convenient, it's easy, and there's some appeals to it. But God says not only to not be part of the world, but we have to abhor what is evil. That means have no partnership in it. Don't laugh at something that's not funny, that's unrighteous. Don't take part in activities that are unwholesome. Have nothing to do with evil deeds. And of course, in verse 11 and 12, some positive things to do. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. But also, we need to be zealous. How do we rejoice? Zealously. How do we pray? Zealously. Have a fervor. Have a fire for God. Love what is good. Seek it. Live it. Pray for it, even. In verse 13, what does it look like in our lives? Well, we need to outdo one another in showing honor, to use a verse 10 phrase. But in verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. That is, we have to go above and beyond. Be looking. That word seek is important. The Bible doesn't just say to do hospitality. It says seek to show hospitality. And that's a distinction with a powerful difference. I have to be looking out for opportunities to serve. Of course, there's another section here, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. We have an obligation to each other, to love one another, to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, there's one thing that gets in the way of this. A pretty easy to understand command, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. My selfishness. I don't want to rejoice with someone who is rejoicing if I feel like it's unfair or I'm not getting my, what is fair to me. And likewise, maybe I don't weep with those who weep because in my estimation, they deserve it. Or in my estimation, it's not that big of a deal. God doesn't call us to make that sort of judgment. He tells us to be there for one another. And even when someone has wronged us, when they have specifically gone out of their way to do something to us, notice the text addresses that as well. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, be, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, verse 18, I do want to add one qualifying statement. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. What that doesn't mean is, well... There are some people who are just so stubborn, I just can't live at peace with them on my side. No, that's not what it means. The indication would be that verse 18 means our job is to be peaceful. Will everyone accept that? No, of course not. They didn't accept that in the Old Testament. They didn't accept that from Jesus himself or even his apostles, certainly even the writer here, Paul. So they're not going to do that with me. But my job is to do the right thing no matter what. Repay no one evil for evil. Trust that God has seized it and he can handle it. But also verse 21, do not overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. That's so important. And a world going back to verse 1 and 2 that wants us to conform us to its image, to make us focused on the here and now rather than God above and be transformed by the renewal of our mind and be imprinted in the shape of Jesus. The world wants to overcome us with evil. But there is a solution for that. It's to trust in God and to overcome evil with good. Hope you join us tomorrow as we study Romans chapter 13.